The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I invite you now to join your imagination with that of Edgar Allan Poe so that together you can create a tale of intense horror to say nothing of mystery. You could have no better companion for such a joint venture, surely, because in all the world there has never been a more accomplished master of the macabre, the terrifying, the grisly. Master, did I say? Correction. Genius. In proof of which, listen... Come on, Vira. Let's go to our cabin and get a good night's rest for a change. I'm tired of walking this deck in the fog. Chill to the bone. I don't want to go to our cabin, but... Well, there's no place else, I suppose. My dearest, you must get over your fear of that oblong box in Cornelius Wyatt's cabin. This... This wild fancy of yours that it's a coffin. Well, whether it is or not, I don't like our cabin being directly across from Wyatt's, and I... <gasps> what is it? There, at the rail. Wyatt and a woman. And the woman is not his bride, Rachel. No, I, I can see that. But who is she then? Unless I'm mistaken, Will. Unless I'm very mistaken. She's the woman. In the oblong box. mystery drama, The Oblong Box, was adapted especially for the Mystery Theater from the Edgar Allan Poe classic by George Lothar and stars Richard Mulligan. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. If you're driving a car, you knew you were going to buy the minute you saw it. Skyhawk. Buick Skyhawk. You just knew a car this streamlined would be easy on gas, and you were right. In published EPA mileage test results, Skyhawk got 25 miles per gallon on the open road and 16 in the city. Skyhawk. It's rakish, it's low slung, it looks European, but it's a Buick. Living free. The Marine Corps doesn't offer jobs to women. They offer careers to women. For today's woman, the Marine Corps can be the career corps. Top pay, equal pay, equal opportunity, equal reward. And you don't have to be one of the boys to get ahead. You can be yourself. A special kind of woman who wants more than a job. A woman who has more to offer. Some people think we play ping pong all day. They're wrong. The USO isn't all fun and games. Today, the USO has millions of problems like this one in Germany. My family's going crazy living in a tiny apartment. Where can we live? Today's USO has millions of problems like this one in Asia. I'm hooked on drugs. Where can I get help? Or this problem in Athens. Our marriage is breaking up. Can you help us? Today's USO has little time for ping pong. We've got serious work to do. We've got lots of new problems here and overseas. The problems are big. How big? Well, if someone asks you, who needs the USO? Tell them, we do, we do. Over 5 million American military personnel and their families need today's USO. And because we get no government funds, we need all your support. Please give to USO through the United Way or local USO campaign. you in the course of our association many a strange and terror-ridden tale, but believe me, none that can surpass that which you're about to hear. It begins aboard the sailing ship Independence in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina in June of 1897. William Hopkins, 
an attorney of some importance, and his wife, Elvira, are standing by the ship's rail near the gangplank, watching the arrival of passengers with more than ordinary interest. Well, it's close on departure time. Are you sure Cornelius White and his bride will be aboard? Oh, it said so in the Charleston Herald yesterday, and I checked the passenger list, which plainly states Mr. and Mrs. Cornelius White, cabin C and D. The cabin's directly across from us. But why two? One for Cornelius and his wife, and the other for, um, well, very likely they'll have a servant with them. Oh, <laughs> Cornelius has gone far since our college days together 20 years ago. He's a world-famous artist now. Do you think he'll remember you? Oh, my dear Elvira, we were the closest of friends. I must admit, of course, that we didn't keep the uh, friendship up through the years, but... Oh, yes, he'll remember me, and well. And there, by heaven, there he comes. Where? Where? The carriage that just came onto the dock. The man in it is Wyatt, and the woman at his side must be his lovely new bride, Rachel. But what in the world is in that wagon behind him? Will, it's a coffin. <laughs> no, Elvira, no. That oblong box doesn't contain a corpse. It contains a priceless painting, a copy of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. Done by a student, Rubini. It's priceless. How do you know all this? The newspapers. There were several stories about Wyatt buying the painting and having a carefully box for the voyage to New York. Well, it certainly looks for all the world like a coffin to me. Uh, you must remember, dearest, the painting is six feet long and two feet wide and requires a box of that size. Ah, ah, Wyatt and his bride are coming up the gangplank. <laughs> I can't wait to see his face when he discovers his old friend, Will Hopkins. All right, board. all right, mind the hand, handle that box with care, will you? You hear me with care? Oh, I'm anxious to see the face of his bride. That's a pretty heavy veil she's wearing. She's beautiful, absolutely ravishing. I will. Right. You've met her. You know her. No, but I know Cornelius White. He could never stand an ugly woman, not even a plain one. Oh, no, nothing but the most beautiful of the female sex for good old wife. You fools, careful, I said. Incompetent idiots. I'll speak to Captain Hardy about this. And you, you, sir, where can I find Captain Hardy? <laughs> I'm afraid I don't know, Cornelius. Cornelius, you address me with a familiarity, sir, that I don't... Well, hold a moment. You're... You're... Will Hopkins. Your old college friend, Will Hopkins. Oh, yes. Yes, so you are. Well, you certainly don't seem very happy to see me again after all these years. Uh, no, no, most happy. <laughs> Great pleasure, but I, I'm a bit upset at the moment. Good Lord, so what are you brainless sailors doing with that box? Damn it! I said keep it on an even keel and right side up. Oh, come now, Wyatt. There's no damage done and certainly a few bumps won't harm the painting if you pack it securely, that is. The painting? The copy of Da Vinci's Last Supper. You, you bought your bride as a wedding gift. It is what's in the box, isn't it? <laughs> it's certainly not a corpse, but, Wyatt. No. No, of course not. And speaking of your bride, aren't you going to introduce me? Oh, good heavens, I forgot my manners. My wife, Elvira. Dear, this is my old friend, Cornelius Wyatt. How do you do? How do you do? Uh... My wife, Rachel. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? And now, you will excuse us, I'm sure. We've, we've got to go at once to our cabin. You mean your cabins, don't you, Mr. Wyatt? You have engaged, too. Uh, we'd expected you to have a servant, Lord. No, no servants. Luggage. Our luggage will go into the second cabin. But you don't have enough luggage for... Oh, the oblong box, of course. You'll need the extra cabin for that. Come along, Rachel. Oh, uh, no, no, but, but wait now, Wyatt. Wait, wait a moment. Surely we're going to have the pleasure of seeing your bride. I mean, won't she raise her veil so we can look at this beauty you've married? Why, uh... Why, yes, I dare say. Rachel, my dear, will your veil... Uh, oh. oh. Not the beauty you expected, Hopkins? Well, no. Uh, uh, no, that is... Yes, yes. Uh, most attractive. You are indeed most attractive, Mrs. White. Or... Or Rachel, if I may. Oh, of course you may. And now you must excuse us. You men with the box, follow me, will you? And please be careful. Take care of it, will you? Take care. Take care of that. Well. Well, is right. She's ugly. Certainly not beautiful. Will. Yes. Don't you sense something peculiar about all this? Well? Something wrong, Elvira? The oblong box, it's in their cabin. 
in the same cabin the Wyatts occupy? Yes. Uh, how do you know? Seems to me Wyatt's gone out of his way to keep their door closed at all times. Well, just as I was coming down from my stroll on deck, the door opened and I saw Rachel go into the other cabin to get something from their luggage, I suppose. And before Mr. Wyatt could close the door, I saw it. The box. But that, that, that makes no sense. These cabins are anything but spacious. In fact, they're downright tiny. That box must occupy practically the entire cabin. Well, it does. That's why it took Mr. Wyatt some moments to close the door. He nearly fell over the box. Well, this is the damnedest thing I've ever heard. They engage two cabins and use the extra one for only a couple of pieces of luggage and keep the box in their cabin. Well, it's, it's idiocy, unless... Yes? That must be it. The painting is so valuable... In fact, Elvira, it's beyond price. Wyatt would even run the risk of letting it out of his sight, which reminds me, what do you say we have a look at it? You mean, ask to see it? Of course. I'm not much on art masterpieces, but, well, a copy of The Last Supper done by one of Da Vinci's own pupils. Something to see, Elvira. Come, come along. Well, Will, are you sure? I mean, yes, I'd adore seeing it, but... Well, your friend, Mr. Wyatt, wasn't exactly friendly, you know. Oh, nonsense. Come along. Old Wyatt was in a bit of a stew, that's all. What is it? Your old friend, Will Hopkins, Wyatt. What do you want? Well, well, nothing, Wyatt, nothing at all, if you're going to continue to be so standoffish. Well, I, I, I didn't mean to. I'm, I'm sorry, Hopkins, really, I am. It's just that... Well, uh, I've had a good many problems these past few weeks, and my nerves are a bit raw, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm truly sorry. No. No, no, I am. Sorry I said what I did. After all, I ought to know you better. I would ask you and your wife in, but as you can see, there's scarcely room to move about because of the box. Oh, that's what we came about, Mr. Wyatt. Meaning what, Mrs. Hopkins? Why, Will thought you wouldn't mind if we had a look at the painting. Oh, I see. And can we... I, I... No, I'm, I'm sorry. It's out of the question. You see, I had to adopt extreme precautions in creating it. Especially to guard against the dampness of a six-day voyage to New York. Uh, the box is sealed. If I remove the lid, the seal will be broken. Sealed? You don't say. With melted wax. Believe me, I, I'd be more than glad to show you the painting, old friend, but it, it simply can't be done. Oh, I understand. I'm sorry. It must be that way, Hopkins, but that's the size of it. Uh, would you excuse me now? I have matters to attend to. Certainly, Mr. Wyatt. Of course. I'm sorry, Elvira, that we couldn't, uh... What's wrong? Strange. Very strange. Oh, now, will you stop? There's nothing strange about not wanting to open a box. He's going to infinite pains to seal with melted wax. But it isn't sealed with melted wax or anything else. What do you mean? You didn't smell it? Well, now you mention it, there... There was an odor of some sort. Yes, an odor of some sort. Come to bed, Will. It's 11 o'clock. No, no, Elvira. I thought I might take a stroll on deck before turning in. Oh, no. Do you think that's wise? There's a gale blowing. Elvira, when it comes to exaggeration, no one can match you. I'd hardly call that a gale out there. A stiff wind, perhaps, but... Not a gale. <laughs> when it comes to splitting hairs, what's the difference between a gale and a stiff wind? I wouldn't know. No, Did you no. hear anything more about that leak in the hole? Oh, yes, yes. I talked to Captain Hardy. No problem. They caulked it without much trouble. Strange, though, that... <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. But it is strange that this ship was in dry dock for three weeks being re before we sailed. Oh, that's the kind of world we live in, Elvira. Nobody cares about doing a good workmanlike job anymore. I'm going on deck for around 10, 15 minutes. Oh, do be careful, Will. Don't get blown overboard by that stiff wind. Oh, oh don't worry. What? What? In... Will. <laughs> but what is it? Well, this is the damnedest thing. The damnedest thing. What? Wait a minute, wait. Well, I'll be... Will Hopkins, if you don't tell me what you... Rachel Wyatt. She just came out of their cabin, looked up and down the passage to be sure she wasn't seen, and then, Elvira, she went into the cabin where they keep the luggage. Well, maybe she needs something out of it. 
Then why did she lock the door? Locked it? Locked it. And why did she look up and down the passage as if... Well, as if she were doing something secretive? Well, since I'm no longer permitted to say I think something is strange... Shh, 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 shh. Listen. What is that? It's coming from the Wyatt cabin, and it sounds to me as if... As if Wyatt's prying off the lid of that oblong box. You're right. That's exactly what it sounds like. Exactly what it was. Then it, then it, then it couldn't have been sealed. I told you that. But, but why would he lie? Especially to an old friend. Well, well, I may be given to exaggeration, but you are naive. Cornelius Wyatt no longer considers you an old friend or even a friend. He doesn't want anything to do with you. As for why he lied, he lied because he doesn't want you or me or anyone else to know what's in that box. What's really in that box? Shh, 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 listen. What's that? What's he saying? He's, he's, he's crying. Crying as if, his, as if his heart would break. Oh, this, this, oh, this is terrible. Look, poor Wyatt. He's in agony, young man. Yes, yes, I can hear him. Poor man. Will, what is he crying over? It can't be the painting. Even if it had been damaged when those sailors bumped the box, Elvira, it, it can't be that. It isn't. Isn't? I told you I've had this feeling all along. This sense of something. You know. And now I'm sure. It isn't a painting that's in that box, Will. It's a corpse. A corpse? And the question that I've been asking myself all along is... Whose... Whose corpse? Do you wonder if Elvira is right? Surely it would seem so. For how else explain the... Hopkins will forgive my use of the word I trust. Strange goings-on in the Wyatt cabin. As it happens, I know the answer. Since I've read the Edgar Allan Poe story. If you haven't, you must wait till I return shortly with Act Two. I want that sinus medicine. Headache tablets? No, sinus medicine. Sinus tablets. Helps the headache and the pressure. Oh, you mean sign-off. Exactly. Headache pain is one thing. A sinus headache is something else. Sometimes your whole face can seem to throb with pain. You want relief. Take sign-off tablets. S-I-N-E-O-F-F. The sinus medicine that gives you a full dose of pure aspirin plus a sinus drainer. Sign-off. The sinus medicine that helps relieve sinus pain while you drain. And Sinoff doesn't stop there. Have you tried Sinoff Sinus Spray, the fastest known form of sinus congestion relief? It works in seconds. That's Sinoff Sinus Spray. When sinus flares up, use Sinoff tablets and spray only as directed. S-I-N-E-O-F-F. Sinoff. Exactly. Sinoff, the sinus medicines in the bright red box. Ladies and gentlemen, today our man in the street interview comes to you from Big City, USA. Uh, excuse me, sir. What, what do you get high on? A big pardon? You know, what do you turn on with? Well, you some kind of a cop? Well, it doesn't make any difference anyhow, because I don't use anything. Then how do you get high? Oh, I get high on a lot of things, like, uh, seeing my kids start to walk, or the first dandelions in the park, you know? Anything else? Mm, Yeah, getting tired gives me a high. If it's a tired, you know, from something I like, like bowling with the guys or taking a long bike ride. But, hey, would you believe polishing my car gives me a high? And it's even legal. In other words, then, it's, uh, you get a natural high. Yeah, natural, that's it. Which, incidentally, doesn't mean that you're high all the time. It'd be unreasonable to expect to be high all the time, you know? It's like getting high on life. Sure, but you got to remember, getting high on life could be habit for me. This mini-interview was brought to you nationwide by the New York State Drug Abuse Control Commission. Well, now, um, where were we? Oh, yes. The Hopkins, Elvira and Will, are totally baffled and just a bit uneasy about the curious actions of Cornelius Wyatt and his bride, Rachel. As the sailing ship Independence makes its way from Charleston, South Carolina, to New York, 
Will and Elvira burn with curiosity to know the contents of the coffin-like oblong box Wyatt brought aboard. Rachel has spent the entire night in the other cabin. Now, what kind of way is that for a newly married couple to act? Her in one cabin, him in another, sobbing and crying his heart out all night long. Maybe they had uh, an argument, uh, a lover's quarrel. Oh, Will, you don't believe that, and neither do I. She didn't act as if they'd quarreled when she came out of the cabin, did she? No, no, acted uh, secretive. As if she didn't want anyone to see her going from one cabin to the other. And then we heard him prying the lid off the box. The box he claimed was sealed. And we've heard him sobbing all through the night. I've said it before, Will, and I say it again. He's not carrying any valuable painting in that box. He's carrying a corpse. But that's impossible. The captain would never allow it. A corpse on board a ship is thought to be a jinx. If the crew even suspected there was a corpse in that box. But they don't. Wyatt has cleverly hoodwinked them and everyone else with the story that the box contains that painting, that copy of Da Vinci's Last Supper. No, Will, I tell you... Listen. Oh, he's nailing the lid back on. What time is it? 6 a.m. Then for seven straight hours since 11 last night, he's been crying over whatever's in that box. Shh, wait, 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 wait. I think, I think I heard... What? Heard what? Just, let me just open our door a crack. There, Elvira. Just as I thought, Rachel has just come out of the adjoining cabin. Yes, looking up and down the passage to make sure she isn't discovered. And there she goes, back into Wyatt's cabin. Well, I'll be damned. I'm frightened. Right down to my toes, frightened to death. you eat, and so ravenously. Because I'm hungry. What did we come up to the dining saloon for if not to have a good breakfast? Well, I can't touch a thing. After the goings on last night, and now hearing that that foremast split and we're, what do they call it, hove to? Only for a few hours, probably. Shouldn't take longer than that to repair it. Say, these eggs are tasty. You ought to try them. I don't know how you can eat. Because I'm not letting this oblong box business get me down the way you are. I want you. You can see I'm not. And you know why? Because I've decided to take the bull by the horns and find out what is in that box before this day is out. That's why. And how exactly do you propose to do that? Mm, don't know yet. Got to figure it out. In fact, I think I just have. What do you mean? Wyatt and his bride have just come into the saloon, see? Yes, and they've seen us. They've changed direction and headed for that table way over in the corner instead. Listen, I'm going down to their cabin while they're having breakfast, and I'm going to find out what's in the box. Oh, no, you can't do that, Will. What if they discover you? That's where you come in. You're going to see to it that they stay right here in the dining saloon till I get back. Well, how can I possibly Just do... go over to their table and start a conversation and keep it going till I return. Oh, Will, I can't. You can, you can. They're just ordering breakfast, all right? Uh, all right. All right, back in 20 minutes or so. Good morning. Morning. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Hoffman. Uh, do you mind if I join you? Why, uh... Oh, well, I... Will's going for a walk on deck, and I couldn't possibly face that gale out there. Uh... I suppose you heard about the foremast splitting during the night. Oh, did it? Well, well, no, we hadn't heard. Oh, it's nothing to worry about, Will says. Says they'll have it repaired in a matter of hours. Uh... And... <coughs> Mr. Wyatt, you're not leaving. Yes, excuse me. But, but you haven't even started your breakfast. I'm not hungry. Anything but hungry. But, but Mr. Wyatt... Oh, dear. What in the... Hopkins, what the devil are you doing in my cabin? Quiet, I... I uh... What are you doing with that knife in your hand? What, I, well, you see... You I... were going to plunge the lid off this box, weren't you? Off my box, my personal property. Ever since you set eyes on this box when I brought it aboard yesterday, you've been ravening to find out what's in it. Nonsense. That, that's nonsense. I, I know what's in it. Uh, you yourself told me a, a priceless copy of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. But you don't believe it. No, of course I, I do. Why shouldn't I? I don't know why you shouldn't. I only know you don't. Why else would you sneak into my cabin and try to pry open the box in my absence? I didn't try to... 
Oh, all right, White. I did. I, yes. I'm sorry. I apologize. It was the wrong thing to do, but, well... Well, damn it, man. I would like to have a look at that painting. Get out of my cabin. Get out this instant. And while you're about it, get out of my life. Why, you you don't mean that. Surely you wouldn't dissolve a friendship of such as ours because of... What this... friendship? I haven't seen you in 20 years. But we were such good friends in college. Whatever we may have been, we no longer are. Now get out, Hopkins. Get out. <laughs> Mrs. Wyatt, how nice to find you here in the lounge. Oh, Mrs. Hopkins. Reading Godet's ladies' book, I see. Yes. I don't know about you, but I don't in the least care for the latest styles. Do you? Oh, well, they're, they're all right, I guess. Oh, but my dear, with all your money, I should think you'd be intensely interested in fashion. Though I did notice... You'll forgive my mentioning this, won't you? An older woman giving advice to a younger sister. I did notice that that lovely, expensive dress of yours could fit a little better. Proper fitting is so important, don't you think? Oh, yes. Yes, I... Well, I just didn't have time to get it fit proper... Pr- properly before we left Charleston. Oh, I... you don't mind my mentioning it, do you? A little sound advice from an old married woman. Oh, you're not old, Mom. Uh, uh, Mrs. Howe, oh, I mean old married. Married many more years than you and Mr. Wyatt. Uh, in fact, you're not married um, even a week, are you? Oh few days is all. A happy days, I'm sure. Oh, yes. And night? What? Uh, oh, uh, uh, Mr. Wyatt. Mrs. Hopkins? Uh, your dear wife and I were just discussing... I would re- prefer, Mrs. Hopkins, that my wife and you discuss nothing, either now or at any other time. Why, Mr. Wyatt... I have already made plain to your husband, as I'm sure he will inform you, that I no longer consider him my friend... And wish to have nothing whatever to do with him. And that, madam, applies to you as well. Come, Rachel. Yes, sir. I mean, Cornelius. Not his wife? You're telling me that the woman in that cabin across the passage, the woman wife introduced as his wife, is not? I don't think so, Will. In fact, I'm sure she's not. Whatever in the world put such a thought in your head? The little chat I had with her before Mr. Wyatt so rudely terminated it. A little chat I deliberately had with her because, quite frankly, Will, my suspicions had been aroused. Aroused by by what? And while you're telling me, I want to keep an eye out to see if Mrs. Wyatt, who is not Mrs. Wyatt, changes cabins again tonight. For one thing, Will, you said Mr. Wyatt was interested only in the most beautiful of women. And Rachel Wyatt is altogether plain. She's downright ugly, but but that's no reason to suspect. Also, when I was talking to her, she slipped and called me Mum. Mum? Only a servant uses that word. Exactly. Also, she slipped again and called Mr. Wyatt Sir. But over and beyond that, Will, what originally aroused my suspicion was her hands. I noticed those when Mr. Wyatt introduced us. They're not the hands of a lady, Will, but the hands of a servant. Hands decidedly work-worn. But that... There's no sense to what you're saying, Elvira. You're saying that Cornelius Wyatt, a world-famous painter, a man of taste, discrimination, wealth, is married to a a servant girl? Ah, she's no gentlewoman, I can tell you that. But good Lord, Elvira, what you say is true. It makes this mystery all the more... Wait, wait, wait. Is she... Again, is she? Yes. Yes, leaving the Wyatt cabin. And yes, yes, looking up and down the passage before slipping into the adjoining cabin. And now he's at it again, taking the lid off that oblong box. If what you say is true, Elvira, what does all this mean? I mean, what what can it mean? It can mean only one thing, that there is a corpse in that box. Box my foot, it's a coffin. And the corpse is that of the real Mrs. Cornelius Wyatt. We'll come to bed. It's no affair of ours. Maybe not of yours, but it is of mine. If Wyatt's in some sort of trouble, if he needs help and for one reason or another is shy of asking for it, it devolves upon me as his friend to assist him in any way I can. After what he said to you and me... Oh, one must make allowances if 
if the trouble he's in is so serious, so unbearable, so... Elvira, I'm going over there. To his cabin? Oh, Will, surely not. Yes. Well, it's three o'clock in I the morning. I don't care what time it is. It's the least I can do, the very oh, least. Now, Will, listen. I'm going over there, I tell you. All right. I know you better than to try and stop you. Just let me get my robe. You stay oh, here. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not letting you go over there at three in the morning alone. You ask me, that man is dangerous. Dangerous? Wyatt, don't be silly. No, don't you. There. I've got my robe on. If you still mean to go, then let's go. All right, all right. Come along. I'll knock. Wyatt? Wyatt, it's me, Will Hopkins. Open up. Wyatt, Wyatt, do you hear me? It's very quiet in there, not like last night when he spent the whole night crying and sobbing and carrying on like I don't know what. Wyatt? Let's go in, Elvira. Cabin's empty. And so is the box. What? Look, the box is open and and there's nothing in it. Neither a painting nor a corpse. Well, now then. Where does that put us? Nothing in the oblong box. Neither the priceless copy of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, nor, as Elvira Hopkins seemed to suggest, the corpse of the real Mrs. Cornelius Wyatt. Baffling? Mystifying? I should say. And I'll have more to say when I return shortly with Act Three. You're on the open road. Rolling free and feeling great about your new Buick Century. Because in published EPA mileage test results, a V6 Buick Century got the best highway mileage of any U.S. midsize car. 24 miles per gallon and 16 in the city. Your Century's comfortable, it's nimble, it's economical, and above all, it's a Buick. Living free. Families would like to visit their relatives in the upstate prisons, but they cannot afford it. So a few churches and other organizations got together to provide the buses and lodgings so they may visit their relatives upstate. The God we worship expects us to remember our neighbors and to help them. Join with others at your local church or synagogue and start treating your brothers and sisters like brothers and sisters. A public service of religion in American life, the Advertising Council and this station. Who knows how to help you solve your shopping problems? Your Better Business Bureau knows. I'm Inspector Pry, miss. Patience. Miss Patience. According to the report, now you say someone is trying to murder you? Yes, but I was warned. A nice man knocked on the door and told me my brick chimney was about to crash through the roof over my head. Luckily, he's in the business and will repair it tomorrow. This sounds serious. I'll help you, Miss Patience. Who are you? I'm the man from the Better Business Bureau. Be skeptical when a man rings your doorbell and says he just happens to be passing by with his repair equipment and notices that your house needs to be worked on. My stars! I could have been hoodwinked by a scoundrel. It pays to be calm and exercise patience. Patience. Just another friendly tip from your Better Business Bureau. Surprise, uh, no, shock is the word to describe the feelings of Elvira and Will Hopkins when they discover that the coffin-like oblong box contains neither that priceless painting nor a corpse. My bump of curiosity is as fully developed as anyone's, I'd say, and frankly, at that point, I'd have dropped the whole business, but not Elvira and Will Hopkins. Not only had their curiosity been sharpened to a keen edge, but, as Will said... Why, it's in trouble, Elvira. Serious trouble. But there's nothing in the box, so why do you think he's in trouble? Because there was something in it, and whatever it was, is, he acted, well, damn strange. He said it contained a valuable copy of Da Vinci's Last Supper. 
and he couldn't open it because it had been sealed against the sea air with melted wax. But he's opened it each night since we left Charleston. And has sobbed his heart out all night long. Whatever he was sobbing over was in this oblong box, and it isn't here now. Where is it? And where's Wyatt at this hour of the morning? 3 a.m.? I tell you, he's in trouble. I feel it in my bones. Will, someone's coming. Rachel. Uh, Mrs. Wyatt from, from from the other cabin. If she is Mrs. Wyatt, which I doubt. What are you doing here, Mr. Wyatt's my husband's cabin? <gasps> the box! The box! What, what about the box, Mrs. Wyatt? Empty! Oh, God, I knew it! I knew it! You what? He's gone mad! I, I knew he would! In my soul, I knew it! Now he has a gun! He has. Why? Why? Why do you think that? The box! The empty box! Well, what about the empty box? <laughs> I can't bear it anymore! I can't! He, I can't. Here, here, now, Mrs. Wyatt, try to control yourself! Oh, he's mad! Gone mad! He's gone mad! Oh. I'm. I'm sorry, but you must pull yourself together if you want us to help you. Help me? You can't help me. You can't help him. It's too late. It's too late. His mind is broken. But why? Because, because of what? Oh, leave me alone. Oh, please, please, leave me alone. Well, I, I think we'd better find Captain Hardy. I think we'd better find Wyatt. I'm going up on deck to see if I can locate him. Well, I'm coming with you. Cold and windy up on deck. Uh, maybe you, you you better stay here. Uh, right now, Will. I'm not staying alone anywhere. Oh, you were right. It's cold and windier than I thought it would be. Here, here, here. Put my oh. jacket around. No, 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 Will. I'll, I'll be all right. Do as I tell you for once. Oh, yes, Will. Yes. Thank you, dear. That is better. Now, come on. Let's see if we can find him in there. Will. Well, there he is, standing at the rail, gazing off across the water. There's there's someone with him, a, a woman, standing beside him. One of the passengers. Maybe. Only, if it is, I, I've never seen him before. Well, I didn't get a good look. Well, you will as soon as that light from the port side lamp falls across her face again. There. Yes. Oh, I see her clearly now. I've never, never seen anyone so beautiful. She's ravishing. She's that all right. Absolutely lovely face. That long, blonde hair blowing in the breeze. No wonder he was holding her close to him. Arm around her waist and... Oh, hey, look. He's kissing her now. Well, that's one for the books. It's the woman he came aboard with. The woman he claims is his wife. If she is his wife, then what is he doing up here on deck with her? You, you've got me. And she isn't one of the passengers. Or if she is, this is the first time I've seen her. Then who the devil can she be? I... Oh, 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 good Lord. El- I, Elvira. I, I, I think I'm going to faint. Take me below to our cabin. Yes, 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 but, 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 but what, what is it? a terrible thought, a horrible thought, a what? horrible... What? What horrible thought? The thought, the thought that what... Whoever she is, whatever she is, Will, Will, she must have been in that box. Madness. Absolute madness, Elvira, to even, to even think such a thing. Wait, you sound as insane as Rachel Wyatt says he is. The woman in that cabin is not Rachel Wyatt. Oh, come now, Elvira. The truth, the plain, simple truth, staring us in the face is that the woman on the deck with him is the real Mrs. Wyatt. Or what? Oh, don't tell me again. Just please don't tell me again what you think. Elvira, it's it's too horrible. Someone at the door at 3.30 in the morning. There you. Thank you. What is it? One of the crew handed me this. There's a note from Captain Hardy. He wants to see me in his cabin at once. Urgent, he says. Well, at this hour of the morning, it must be. What in the world would he want to see you about? Only one way to find out. Uh, Sit down, Mr. Hopkins. Sit down. Thank you, Captain. Mr. Hopkins, as you know, we've had nothing but bad weather and bad luck since leaving Charleston Harbor three days ago. (laughs) I guess all your passengers are aware of that, Captain. Yes. We sprung a seam. The foremast developed a bad crack. 
There have been other problems which, frankly, I've concealed from the passengers so as not to alarm them. It's understandable, but... I will tell you in all confidence, Mr. Hopkins, in confidence, man, that we couldn't manage to cork that seam properly in these heavy seas. It's getting worse. Even worse, the repair to the foremast isn't holding. And if the foremast goes, we'll be in serious trouble. There's a force six gale out there right now, Mr. Hopkins. And he's whipping up. But, Captain, why are you telling me all this? What can what can I do? Well, you can tell me something that I need to know, that the crew needs to know. It's got them worried. I I still don't understand. Mr. Hopkins, I'm given to understand that you are a very close friend of Mr. Cornelius Wyatt's. Uh, Mr. Hopkins. What is Mr. Wyatt carrying in that oblong box? Why, well, uh, a copy, uh, a priceless copy of The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. Have you seen it? Uh, no. Well, the crew are beginning to think that it contains a body, a corpse. And that because of it, this ship is jinxed. Yes, I, um, I'm aware of the uh, superstition. I find myself in a position where I must assure the crew that their suspicions are unfounded. Accordingly, I ask you to go to your friend at once now and get from him the truth of what is in that oblong box. If it's the painting, we're in good. And if it's a corpse? Well, then I shall be well within my rights as captain of this vessel to take proper action. And that would be? To consign the body to the sea. For God's sakes, Elvira, what sense is there in asking Wyatt to show me what's in the box when he's damn well going to refuse? And when we've got a pretty good idea of what is in the box. Then you agree with me finally. You think it's a corpse. I don't. I think it's the woman we saw on deck with Wyatt. And you know the thought that crossed my mind about that. A thought uh, too horrible, too, too revolting, gruesome even to contemplate. Who would take a corpse on deck? Who would make love to a corpse? A madman would. A man who'd gone out of his mind. Well, well what was that? If you ask me, Captain Hardy's worst fears and realized the foremast is broken. signal for the boat station. God help us, it is. Oh, Will. Will, what's going to happen to us? What are we going to do? Head for our boat station, that's what. Come on, come on. Oh, wait, wait, with my jewelry. The hell with the jewelry, woman. Come on. Now, who can that be? Oh, Mr. Hopkins, help me. Help me. Mrs. Wyatt. I'm not Mrs. Wyatt. I'm not his wife. I'm only a servant. A mayor. A servant. Oh, help me. He's got a man. Not his wife. His servant. Hers. Rachel Carruthers. Her servant until she died within two days of her marriage. Died? died within two days. He went out of his mind with grief. He, he didn't know what he was saying or doing. All he knew, all he could think of was they'd planned this voyage for their honeymoon and there was no stopping him. He would take her on the honeymoon he promised. Take her dead or alive. Take her dead. Lord in heaven, how right I was. How horribly right. Never mind that now. We're wasting precious time. Come on. We, we must get to the life of What about him? Him? Uh, Wyatt? Yes, he's in there now, sitting beside her coffin. I, I tried to tell him we were in danger, but he wouldn't listen. All right, all right. I'll see what I can do. Uh, oh. Elvira, you and Rachel, uh, Mary, whatever, get to the boat. Oh, but you. I'll join you. Will. I promise I'll join you, but I must try to save Wyatt if I can. Go now, the two of you. Go. No, not without you. Remember, I'll not go without you, Will. Wyatt. Yes? Wyatt, the ship's in danger. It, it, it may be foundering. That bell you hear, it's a call to all boat stations. Oh. Wyatt, stop sitting there staring at a corpse. Corpse? Corpse? The corpse. The body of your wife. Your dead wife. <laughs> She's not dead, Hopkins. That's what they said, the doctors, but they were wrong. Only sleeping. She's only sleeping, Hopkins. And soon she'll wake up very soon now. Quiet. Quiet. Isn't she beautiful? Isn't she the loveliest creature you ever seen on this earth, Hopkins? Will you listen to me? The ship uh, is foundering. If we don't get to the boats, we'll drown. Uh, Wyatt, Wyatt will drown. Drown? Did you say drown? Yes. Oh, no. Drown. No, no, Hopkins, she'll not drown. Not my Rachel. 
Rachel, Rachel, dear, what? can you hear me? Quiet, quiet. What are you come, doing? Come, darling. Time to wake up. Sweetheart. In heaven's name, man, she's dead. Rachel. Dead, do you hear me? I can't wake her. Deep asleep in a deep sleep, Hopkins. And help me. How? And lend a hand. I've got to get her on deck into a lifeboat. Can't let her drown. You're not, Give me a hand here. You're not. You're, you're not going to try to try to get. What else can I do? She's sound asleep. She's dead. Dead. There. She's sitting up. Oh, good lord. Now we'll just. The Hopkins, if if you'll only just please help me to get her out of this box. Quiet, quiet. Come to your senses. There. She's on her feet. Oh, oh my lord. In a deep sleep. But that's all right. I'll walk her. We'll walk her up to the boat. Get, get your arm around her, Hopkins, on the other side. No. Oh. Hopkins, I can do this alone, but it would help me if you were... No. Damn it, Hopkins. Will you please? No. There. That better, Elvira? More comfortable. I'll be all right, Will. A lifeboat isn't expected to be the most comfortable place in the world. Mary. Oh, thank you, sir. I, I'm all right. She's going down, I think. The ship getting lower in the water. Captain, is she? Yes. Foundering. Look! Oh, look! What is it, Mary? It's him! Mr. Wyatt Stern! Dick! You see? Oh, no. No. Oh, he brought a cross oh. on deck. Look, he... He's propping it against the rail, his arm around it. Oh, he's kissing it. Will, how gruesome. Beautiful. Beautiful, though, in a way. Somehow, beautiful. Beautiful? How can you say that? Because to him, she's still alive. And if there is a life after death... She must know that few men have ever loved a woman as as he loves her. Uh, she's going now. My ship. Going. And they with her. Please, God. Be with him. Please. you enjoyed the oblong box and if you did we'll think for a moment on the memory of Edgar Allan Poe to whom we owe the macabre pleasure of the last hour like Oscar Wilde's his was a life of torment that came to a tragic end yet out of the crucible of his torment and tragedy came infinite pleasure for others something to ponder on I think don't you? I'll be back shortly. Young I may be, but still I'm a man. Just turned 18 and I'll do what I can to find me a place where I can be me. Get ready for life and be free and see. Where do I go from here? Oh, where do I go from here? I finished the school, but what lies ahead? Don't want to get trapped, want to feel free. about the new Navy. You'll get your chance at success, learn an exciting job, and see the world. Call toll-free 800-841-8000. That's 800-841-8000. Or see your Navy recruiter. Be someone special in the new Navy. I know where I'm going from here. I heard recently that a little cottage on the Grand Concourse in the borough of the Bronx, New York City, is to be torn down. Why? Because it is constantly vandalized, 
and the city can no longer afford to keep it up. When I was very young, I went to visit it more than once and stood in the tiny room where a beloved young wife died and a grief-ridden husband drowned his grief in alcohol, but where he also wrote the story you heard tonight. I say no more. What more is there to say? Our cast included Richard Mulligan, Grace Matthews, Bryna Rayburn, and Kurt Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Go on. I don't know that I can. I've never understood what made these people what they were, but this I know. There are angels on this earth and there are devils. And you, madam, I say it to you, even in your dying moments, you are a devil. I don't blame you for looking at me like that. I I spoke on impulse. I'm ashamed. Ashamed? You are the first man who has ever dared to... Berenice. Stay away. Stand back. Don't, Don't touch me. Only listen. You will be haunted by the magnet that drew you to me. The weapon with which I ruined your life and will destroy you. My smile, Ernest. My smile. No. Look at me. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the Sinus Medicines, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Mystery Theater continues Edgar Allan Poe Week, celebrating the first anniversary of the Mystery Theater tomorrow night at 10.30 on KRNT.